And a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Issues and Attitudes. My name is Jeff Owens, Dr Interim Director at WEIU-TV and Radio. And my guest today is Mr. Eric Davidson. He's the Interim Director of Health and Counseling Services here at EIU. Welcome, Eric. Hi there. Good to have you uh, back once again. I, I guess it's good, right? <laughs> if you weren't here, that means we might have had a massive cure. Exactly. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about COVID and the pandemic and how Eastern is... Uh, kind of you know dealing with it and from your perspective but i guess uh, everybody knows that classes started today yes on the campus of eiu so i guess what are your initial expectations uh, for students and professors today well i'm actually really pleased to, to report that uh, you know when i've been out and about on campus you know one of the expectations is that everybody's masked and uh, when I've been out and about, uh, you know, a good majority, almost all the students that I'm encountering are, are wearing masks and doing so appropriately. Um, so we're, we're really excited by that. Um, you know, another expectation is maintaining social distance, being more than six feet away from, from one another. And uh, I, I think our students are, are doing a, a pretty decent job with that as well. Friday night, I had the opportunity to, to be out on the tundra uh, where University Board was uh, doing a, a bingo activity, and uh, the, the grounds crew had done a, a great job working with University Board and, and maintaining grids where people could sit, and for the most part, everybody was masked, everybody was socially distant. Um, so, you know, the, the expectations that we have been communicating to our community really do seem to be upheld, and, and I'm really excited by that. Now, at uh, your office, I mean, what is kind of the game plan of how you deal with positive tests and and kind of go forward as we as right, we talk about the semester? Definitely. Um, in our medical clinic, we are, are conducting diagnostic tests. So uh, we're not doing surveillance screening. We're not doing anything like that. If a, if a student comes to the medical clinic um, and they're reporting symptoms, they're seeing one of our clinicians, and then the clinicians is typically ordering a test. Um, we uh, are basically collecting the specimen and, and sending the specimen out to Sarah Bush, uh, who sends it on to Carl for analysis. So then if a, a student ends up getting a positive, um, we're typically notified by Sarah Bush. We're typically also notified by the, the Coles County Health Department. Um, if the student has indicated a, a residency in uh, Coles County, and then we're reaching out to the student, letting the student know about the positive results. And from there, it kind of, uh, kickstarts a, a wide variety of actions. Um, if the student lives on campus, we're then working with housing to relocate the student to one of the isolation or quarantine rooms that we have available. We're also working with Coles County Health Department and, and sharing that information with them so that way they can uh, institute contact tracing with, with those that are in quarantine and have been exposed or those who have been positive and, and have positive test results. And then uh, among those those students that are in quarantine or isolation, if they're symptomatic, then my clinicians are reaching out to them one a day to monitor their symptoms and make sure that they're uh, uh, not getting any worse than what they've been. That's what I was wondering. I was hoping that somebody is checking on them and, and, and making sure that they are taking care of in terms of meds and, and, and nourishment and all that. Very much so. And then uh, in addition to, to my staff doing uh, contacts with those that are symptomatic, uh, the, the trace contactors from the county health department um, will have some form of contact with everyone in quarantine and isolation every day. Okay. Um, it seems like every day we talk about all this off mic, there's always new rules and new changes <laughs> coming down from health associations, governments, and, you know, everywhere. So how do you kind of keep up and enforce all this stuff? It, it's kind yeah, of just crazy. It's, um, I, I like to tell people that I haven't been doing as much research since I did my dissertation. Um, <laughs> the only thing is, is everything keeps changing on us. Um, I'm on several listservs. Um, I get updates from the Department of Public Health, um, from the American College Health Association, so that allows us to, to have a, a broad view. Um, I also am on the emergency management team, uh, which has, uh, you know, different folks from all across campus and all the different divisions, and, and they too are on listservs and are talking with their colleagues at other universities. Um, so we're able to share information between one another that way. So, um, you know, this is not a journey that I'm taking by myself. There are a lot of other people that uh, have their hands involved and are, are getting information, and, and sometimes 
sometimes it's really just triangulating. I have this piece of information. You may have this piece of information. Someone else has a third and, and trying to figure out the overlap. So, uh, but uh, it is a Herculean task based upon all the information coming down. And, and speaking of that, I want to talk a little bit about, I know that, that there's a new COVID dashboard on the, on the EIU.edu, yeah. but what is kind of the public policy in terms of notification and, and how can you do that with, I know there's HIPAA laws and there's things that you can release, but what is the public policy? Because I think with classes starting today, more parents are going to want to know what's yeah. happening on campus. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the dashboard is our primary method of, of communicating what numbers we have. Um, getting numbers is kind of challenging because we have so many different intakes for that data. Um, you know, it's easy for me to provide the number of tests and the number of positives from the medical clinic, um, but then you also have results going into Coles County. You have results going to HR. So, um, you know, there are a lot of people working together to try to make sure that our numbers are accurate, that we're not over duplicating. Um, but that dashboard is, is really the, the primary method. Um, it is planned to be updated every Tuesday. So okay. uh, for those of you that are, are watching that, if you go tomorrow, it'll it'll be updated sometime tomorrow. Um, but you bring up a really good point. You know, how do we let the public know uh, about what's going on? And, and at this point in time, we're, we're airing on privacy protections. Um, so, um, you know, faculty, for example, if, if they're aware that a student is positive in their class, um, they're not really being encouraged to share that because it would be so easy for the students to look around the room and go, oh, Joe's not here. Yeah. Joe's got to be the person that, that Professor X is talking about. Um, and at this point in time, that process has worked out really well. And, uh, you know, the dashboard really gives a good indication of what's going on, as well as looking at what the, the county data is producing, too. Now, everybody's, you know, obviously worried about the students and their health. But what happens on the professor side? If a professor uh, tests positive, I mean, what happens? Do you know what happens to that course or class? Or what is the game plan there? Um, I, I know really, that's not really under Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I could probably speak generically about it. Um, you know, a lot of it's going to depend upon upon if the faculty member is in quarantine and asymptomatic and is it something that they can continue to deliver in yeah. that process. Probably what is most concerning would be if a faculty member is symptomatic and, and symptoms are so strong that they're not able to deliver the course. And my, my guess is, is that's going to vary from department to department, yeah. depending upon the faculty and who can cover that class and how long that class needs to be covered. How concerned are you about an outbreak on campus? And I take a big, I know you're concerned, but I mean, uh, when you think about it, I mean, when you, do you sleep well at night thinking about I, it or, I, or not? I don't. I don't. My sleep patterns have not been good for for the last few weeks um you know it is a concern and and it's it's something that regardless of everything that is being done it's it's something that we can't control um we can do our best to mitigate everything and, and there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things on campus as well as off campus to do that um, um but I worry about it. Um, you know, some would find it interesting to believe that the Illinois Department of Public Health's definition of a COVID outbreak would be two or more people that are, are linked. Um, and that would be very easy to meet. Um, so, you know, when we go by that definition, we'll, we'll definitely have an outbreak. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was just two or more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. What about uh, your advice to students who want to leave campus slash Charleston uh, for a weekend or a night away or something like that? I mean, I know they want them to stay here, but how can we? Yeah. You know, um, the great thing about living in the United States is we don't have those restrictions. So, and, and we're going to have students, faculty, and, and staff who are going to want to leave the Charleston area. So what I always say is, you know, if you're going to go somewhere, do everything that we expect you to do here. Wear a mask, maintain social distance, wash your hands, keep uh, sanitizer available. You know, if you have a, a choice of being with a larger group or a smaller group, go with the smaller group. You know, a lot of the things that we are promoting people to do here are the things that they should really do elsewhere. Um, you know, the other thing that I would add, and, and, and what I keep hearing anecdotally is, um, you know, it's the one time people weren't masked or the one time people weren't socially distant and it was with a family member or with a friend, you know, someone that they trusted. Um, I think with this, you have to err on the side of caution and believe that COVID is everywhere. 
everybody could have COVID and any place you go is a COVID hotspot. And you just have to be diligent and, and doing everything that you need to do 100% of the time. We're talking to Eric Davidson. He's the Interim Director of Health and Counseling Services here on the campus of Eastern Illinois University. I know there, the testing, the initial testing you said went well. Uh, yes. and there's more testing this week for students to take advantage of? Yes, yes. So uh, two weeks ago, we had two days of testing, mainly for staff and faculty, uh, with the idea that if faculty and staff were to be positive, um, they would be able to go through their 10 days of isolation before the beginning of the semester. Um, um, we had actually had about 475 faculty and staff who went through on those two days. Uh, last week, we had another two days of, of testing, mainly for new students. Uh, we did see some returning students and some faculty and staff go through. We had about 400 people go through uh, during those two days, and, and I'm really excited and happy to say uh, that uh, at this point in time, we only had five positives out of that 400, so uh, a really low positivity rate. And then uh, this week on Wednesday and Thursday, we will also have another two days mainly geared for returning students students, but if there were any new students who missed last week or any staff and faculty who missed, they'll be able to, to go through those two days as well. I know that the university has put up all kinds of signage and there's a lot of new, new hand sanitizing stations around uh, and where to how to get through and in, out, uh, in and out of buildings. So the campus has really been cleaned well uh, for the start of school. Can you give us a little background of all what's been done? Because I know you were on yeah, the same Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, our facilities crew and, and staff have done a phenomenal job. Um, as you have, have indicated, they have done a really great job of cleaning and sanitizing and, and looking at different spaces. And as we have moved uh, classes to different spaces, making sure that those spaces are cleaned every day. There's a disinfection team that uh, goes out every night after midnight. And uh, I referred to them as the Ghostbusters because <laughs> they've kind of got a little backpack and they, they spray mist and, and uh, sanitize that. And uh, they're, they're doing that as well. Um, you've talked a, a lot about the signage. So uh, you know, there was a, a great group of people uh, on a marketing committee, which included you as well. And, um, you know, that group has worked on, on creating signage that is consistent and, and looks uniform. And uh, that has been a, a big success of our social marketing campaign. And in addition, there's been a lot of signage that has been put up. And uh, Chris Phipps, who's our environmental health and safety officer, has done a really great job working with uh, the building coordinators and department heads and unit heads in each of the buildings to put signage up to route uh, traffic flow to, to minimize exposure and and people crossing paths and uh, again just a lot of people working really really hard uh, to try to, to communicate positive messages and, and appropriate traffic flow and uh, you know keeping the buildings up and, and safe for everybody when you were out about on campus or even in the community what do people ask you the most Oh, um, you know, is it bad? Are we seeing a lot of positives? Um, you know, for that, I would say go to the dashboard, look at the county. Um, I think one of the other questions is, oh, my, my, son or, my, my son or daughter is going to this campus, and, and they're doing this, or they're doing that, and, and why isn't Eastern doing that? And uh, every campus is different, and every campus is unique, and, uh, you know, some things we're, we're doing in alignment with many of the other state universities. I know that Dr. Glassman meets with the other presidents on a weekly basis. Um, I meet with the other health services service directors on a weekly basis as many of my my peers are so you know there's a lot of commonalities but because every institution is different with different resources different staffing um, different organizational structures you'll you'll find some differences and the other thing that people are you know that are aware of I think now but everybody knows about the COVID and the sickness but the mental aspect the mental health aspect yeah. of this is really starting I think it takes hold on all of us, to be honest. Uh, how do you deal with that, and what are you? What are your plans to deal mm -hmm. with students for that? Very much so. Um, our our counseling clinic is open. Um, we're attempting to to mainly do telecounseling and. and uh, online counseling through Zoom when possible to try to minimize COVID spread. But uh, if students want to come in and, and see face-to-face, -face, there's that option available. And, and as we do with any semester during any given day, I have a counselor who's available for crisis intervention. So, um, you know, we've, we've got therapeutic support for our students that, that may be struggling and having some challenges. Um, through our Health Education Resource Center, we're also offering uh, a variety of, of educational programs and, and health promotion 
promotion programs, and a lot of those tend to be online as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, to maintain our services for mental health um, while we're still putting a lot of time and energy into COVID, and, and, and those two are interrelated. So um, we'll, we'll have to see what the semester has in store. There you go. I know that uh, there are right now there's it's it's a hybrid you can either some classes are all online some are in person talk about the in-person classes and what students should do and maybe what the public needs to know what the students yeah. and the teachers are doing in yeah. those classes yeah. um again most of of our in-person classes have been relocated to other locations to accommodate social distancing um so in, in many of the classes uh the larger auditoriums for example will have chairs that are, are mock, marked off that students cannot sit in um, uh, to maintain that social distancing. I just gave a presentation in, in uh, one of the, the auditoriums in, in Lumpkin Hall, and uh, I, you know, I would say two-thirds of the chairs were marked to where you could not sit down, and if, if there were open chairs, there was plenty of ample space. Um, going into the room, there were hand sanitizing stations right outside the door, wipes outside the door, so if a student wanted to sit down and, and wipe an area before they sat down, they could do that. Um, I uh, at the podium there was plenty of, of sanitizer and cleaning agents so if a, a faculty member wanted to clean the station before they began their class they could do that and uh, and again a, a lot of signage basically saying enter in this door exit out of that door with the hopes of minimizing uh, contact and exposure as, as people are walking by so um, and I also know that those classrooms are, are again getting ghost busted every <laughs> night I like that um, so they're they're going in and uh, you know taking care of that and if there were to be a situation arise in which uh, a student was positive and had been in a classroom and and they thought that that environment would not be safe um, faculty have the the means of shutting down that space uh, making some contacts and then a decision would be made whether or not the, the Ghostbusters would go in to spray the space during the afternoon or, or wait for the next cleaning cycle. And the COVID-19 from what you learned from your study on this is it's not really airborne it is more touch correct? Yes is at this point in time I mean it's 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 spread through droplets yeah um, you know so it, it attaches to a droplet it spreads through the air that way. It could land on a surface. There is some research about airborne, and, and that's emerging, and, and we'll just have to see how that turns out. Um, I know that has been a concern, and, and I know one of the things that uh, facilities has done to try to address that concern is that they've gone out, and, and where possible, they've bought a, a higher grade of HEPA filter and have really tried to install those HEPA filters on, on as many of the air circulation systems as they can. What are your thoughts? on a future vaccine for COVID-19? and um, You know, I, I'm kind of ambivalent about it. I, I know that it'll come. I, I don't know when it'll come. I, I keep hearing, oh, we'll have one by December and we'll have one by late March, spring, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and, and I really can't predict when that will happen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll get it in the spring. I'm sure that once one is available, we'll be offering it to the university community. And, um, you know, I hope that it... it goes through all the, the, the safety um, and research procedures and, and we can feel confident taking it with minimal negative consequences or side effects. Would you take it? I mean, if a vaccine I think I will. I you think know, I will. At, at first I was one of those, I don't know, but now I think for sure I would. I think I, I would take the chance just yeah. because I want to I want to move on and I think everybody does. Yeah. So I think yeah. I'm, I'm on the end on that one. I'm, um, I'm in a high risk category so I probably would be strongly recommended by many of my doctors to do so. So, yeah. Are there some other simple things, I'm going to put you on the spot with this when I apologize, Eric. Is there other simple things that students and teachers and even the public can be doing to, to try to, to help out. Everybody knows about the mask and washing, but there are other things, maybe the tricks of the trade that you've learned? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important is, is cleaning. And, and one of my worries, you know, with students coming to campus is typically cleaning a residence hall room is the last thing on their mind. <laughs> it's probably a, a few of the last things that they plan to pack unless mom and dad say, hey, you, you need yeah. to do this. So, you know, I, I think cleaning is, is really important and sanitizing and and, uh, you know, one of the other things that we've talked a lot about in the medical clinic, particularly with our students, is, um, you know, will students wash their mask? And will they do so on a regular basis? Or will we have students that will, you know, basically wear the same mask all semester? And it's it's important to, to make sure your masks are clean and, and washed on a regular basis. So almost daily is what Almost is. daily so is good yeah, to have exactly. a good supply, right? Exactly. So if, if you only have one or two masks, 
make sure you're you're washing it even if you're doing it by hand and and if not you know maintain a, a good supply of mask all right. Again, we're talking to Eric Davidson. He is the Interim Director of Health and Counseling Services here on the campus of EIU. What other things do you offer? I mean, we talked a lot about COVID and everything, but what other things do you do and are offering the students this fall? Yeah. Um, you know, our medical clinic is, is really a primary care clinic. We're open from 8 in the morning to, to 5 in the evening. So uh, in addition to, to all things COVID that we're seeing, we we see what you would see in a primary care clinic. We get upper respiratory infections, sprains, strains, uh, STIs, all of, of those things that you would see. We have a, a lab on site so we can do most of our lab work on campus and not have to send it out. We also have x-ray. Um, so we can really see a lot of the, the, the medical needs that our students have that are, are primary care oriented. Um, we also have a pharmacy, so if, if students get uh, script orders through our providers, they can get those filled at our pharmacy. If they have script orders from outside physicians, they can also get that filled at our pharmacy if it's in our formulary. So, um, you know, pretty much what you would expect from, from a medical clinic. And, and then we have the, the counseling clinic we talked about, and we also oversee the student insurance program. So, um, you know, just a wide variety of services devoted to, to health and wellness of our, our students. This question I didn't know uh, when I asked, I didn't know what the rule was, but you said two or two or more in 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 uh, linked together means yeah. that we have an outbreak. Let's say that we have a worse outbreak. We have 12, 15, 20. What game plan do you kick in at the health services that that we would all have to be under? Yeah. So uh, you know, part of what we do when students come in is is try to kind of get to know them, and then if we start seeing those trends. Um, really kind of doing some interventions. So, um, you know, if we ended up having a group that might end up having several positives, um, as well as several people that were quarantined, you know, we would encourage them to get tested. Um, we would encourage them to, to look at where they're living. If they're on campus, it's a little bit easier for us because we can move them to quarantine spaces. If we have a, a group of students living off campus, um, you know, one of the things that we're going to encourage them to think about is kind of splintering and fracturing up uh, to, to move away from one another. Um, because that could really create a long-term situation. Yeah. You know, if a student's positive and people don't leave the house and they can't isolate or quarantine, everybody has to wait till that person gets well and then their quarantine officially starts. But then if a second person gets sick, the cycle starts then they over. have to wait for that person to get well and then their 14 days of quarantine starts again. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a lot of different things. I know on campus, if, if there are different offices or units or, or spaces uh, where people have been at, you know, we'll, we'll assess the need to clean it and sanitize it. And, and again, I keep referring to them as the Ghostbusters. We'll, <laughs> I like we'll send the Ghostbusters out uh, if needed or we'll wait till the next cleaning cycle and get that space taken care of. I know you said you talked to some of your peers at other universities here in the state. In the state, um, are they doing anything different than we are? Or are we kind of you guys all kind of following the same pattern? And I know money's also yeah, a factor. Yeah, Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody's kind of different based upon the size of, of universities and, and the sizes of the health service. So, you know, I like to say U of I is doing a lot of great things, but there's no way that I could compete with them. I mean, they have over 100 medical providers. I have four. Um, you know, so resources are, are really important. But, you know, I think most of us are, are doing diagnostic testing um, when possible. Several of us are looking at antigen testing to, to maybe increase the amount of testing that we can do. Um, you know, everybody's kind of looking at upper respiratory infections and knowing that, uh, you know, in a few weeks, we're probably going to start seeing flu as well and, and trying to figure out how do we discern whether it's flu or COVID and, and how do we treat each separately. Um, so I think, you know, among the health services, there's there's a lot of similarities as far as we can go. But again, resource differences are, are, are really important. So. With this testing that's going to come this week for the IU students, um, is it voluntary, mandatory, or is it? It's it's voluntary. voluntary. We now, encourage it, but it's it's voluntary. Yeah. What's the turnaround time for that test? You know, um, we looking at last week, we started ended up getting results back on late Thursday afternoon, early Friday morning. We we did get some results back this morning, but it's because the clinic was closed.
closed Saturday and Sunday. So, um, but again, if, if there are any positives, the hospital has been really great about letting us know that even before the results have come through the system. And we've reached out to those students and, and started taking the appropriate means. If a parent was was to call you uh, just to be uh, in need of assurance that uh, Eastern's <laughs> doing everything, what would you tell the, the mom and dad? I, I would say we are doing everything that we can do in, in, in our power. Um, you know, again, a lot of people have been working hard. This has been a team effort. It just hasn't been health and counseling services. Um, you know, we've, we've approached it as a, as a group and, and tried to identify risk. We've done our best to, to address those risks. Um, you know, I would say that uh, many of the things that we're doing are things that everyone else is doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be safe, but there is always some risk. Um, yeah, I got a couple minutes left here with Eric Davidson. Anything that I didn't get to that you'd love the public to know about today, what the Director of Health and Human Counseling uh, Services at the IU is doing? Uh, sure. One of the, um, the the projects that we worked on this summer, and, and, and the data is preliminary, is that we actually asked our students to complete a, a survey about their attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions um, regarding COVID protective behaviors. And uh, we were really looking at, at social norms and uh, what the data preliminarily shows is, is what we would expect. More often, students are in favor of protective behaviors such as mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing. Um, and many of them are reporting that they're doing those things. And the amount that are reporting doing those things far exceeds their perception of what other people are doing. So, you know, for example, um, one of the data points is about 92% of students strongly agree that hand washing is important. But when we ask them, well, how important do you think other students think it is? Um, 48% think that other students think it's important. So again, uh, large differences between what they believe and what they perceive, and uh, that's positive. And I think that attributes to why we're seeing so many of our students wear a mask, maintain social distancing, doing all the things that we've been encouraging them to do. And I wasn't in Charleston this weekend, but I heard it wasn't terrible in terms of some of the events, no major big gigantic parties, some people may be out and about a little bit, but they're going to do that. So were you pleasantly surprised about the first weekend? I was, I was. I am a, a member of the student support team, which is a, a group on campus that meets weekly and uh, typically we talk about behavioral issues and behavioral concerns and uh, from the, the conversation that we had meeting this morning, you know, it, it was a pretty light weekend. Um, I did turn on the scanner for a few moments, and, uh, you know, there were some complaints uh, about parties where students weren't being masked. And my understanding, that, you know, the challenge is, is mask wearing is not really a law, so it, it makes it real difficult for UPD and CPD to go bust a party just because people aren't wearing masks. That would be unconstitutional and, and create a, a whole series of issues. But uh, I think UPD and CPD would approach the party and say, hey, can you mask and, and move on? One last question. It's a funny one. How many different masks does Eric Davidson own? Oh, my goodness. I think I probably have about 15 now. <laughs> okay. I got about six or seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming today. Thanks for having us. I know you guys are swamped over there. That's Eric Davidson, Interim Director of Health and Youth Counseling Services here on Eastern Illinois University's campus. Everybody stay safe today. This is WEIU. Everybody have a great day.